is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth.
the chance that there are, are aliens out there, which I totally believe there are, I'm going to be with the scientists on this one and say, let's get prepared. Greetings, citizens of Earth. My people have developed technologies which allow us to throw off our physical forms and travel great distances in the blink of an eye. We are in dialogue with your leaders to help the human race survive its infancy, for we believe in you. We are helping your scientists find cures for diseases which afflict your bodies and helping you to preserve your planet's most precious resources. Many among us wage peace, and one day, with our help, war may be a thing of the past. Our armies are being strong and growing. We will bring you a cure for many known diseases. We will provide technology that will change the way you live. We will bring peace to every nation on your planet. We are the visitors. We are of peace. Perhaps we need some outside universal threat. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. And we are going to come up against the limits of our own mortality in a way we never could before. And a lot of the things that happen, good and bad, will be stranger than anything ever written in science fiction. I believe that now that we know there are not hundreds, not millions, but billions of other solar systems out there, Thanks to the Hubble telescope and what we know about black holes in the universe and all of that, the, the dimensions of physics are such that I would be quite surprised if in the lifetime of people that are no older than 30 here, we don't discover some form of life in another universe. So I think there are lots of interesting discoveries, biological, on Earth, and other discoveries in the heavens that those of you who are younger will get to see unfold. You'll have all kind of problems with them, but on balance it'll be a plus. And it'll make life much more interesting. Could you believe there are videos now of probably angels in the sky? These events are becoming more and more frequent. People are noticing them more and more. Okay, this is more close up. What the heck is that? I know. 
speaking from Radloff. The generation now alive is privileged to see the birth pangs of the birth of a new civilization. Albert Pike shows his opinion on Christianity and morals and dogma, stating, quote, the teachers, even of Christianity, are in general the most ignorant of the true meaning of that which they teach. There is no book of which so little is known as the Bible. To most who read it, it is as incomprehensible as the Zohar." End quote. This idea of sun worship is part of the mystery school teachings and has been the crutch of these esoteric wisdom writings in the last few centuries attempting to explain the misunderstanding of biblical Christianity and the man of Jesus. Manly P. Hall refers to the sun in regards to Jesus, quote, The adoration of the sun was one of the earliest and most natural forms of religious expression. From a deep philosophic consideration of the powers and principles of the sun has come the concept of the Trinity as it is understood in the world today. This orb, being the symbol of all light, has three distinct phases, rising, midday, and setting. The coming of the sun was hailed with joy. The time of its departure was viewed as a period to be set aside for sorrow and unhappiness. This glorious radiant orb of day, the true light which lighteth every man who cometh into the world, the supreme benefactor who raised all things from the dead, who fed the hungry multitudes, who stilled the tempest, who after dying rose again and restored all things to life, this supreme spirit of humanitarianism and philanthropy is known to Christendom as Christ, the Redeemer of worlds, and only begotten of the Father, the Word made flesh, and the hope of glory." End quote. Not surprisingly, Helena Blavatsky also refers to astronomical underpinnings of Christianity. Quote, it is useless and vain for the Protestants to explain against the Roman Catholics for their mariolatry based on the ancient cult of lunar goddesses when they themselves worship Jehovah, preeminently a lunar god, and when both churches have accepted in their theologies the Son Christ of the Lunar Trinity." End quote. So according to these writers, which in essence is what Peter Joseph did in the first section of his film Zeitgeist, Christians have been doing for centuries was actually worshipping the Son and the stars rather than God and Jesus Christ. What's interesting to note is that a single verse in the Bible can explain that this is simply not the case. In 2 Kings 23.5 it states, quote, he did away with the pagan priests appointed by the kings of Judah to burn incense on the high places of the towns of Judah and on those around Jerusalem, those who burn incense to Baal, to the sun and moon, to the constellations, and to all the starry hosts." End quote. The ideas and opinions which permeate through society now in regards to Christianity are a residue to what we see in the esoteric writings. Even if the majority of the people who hate fundamental Christianity and religion in general are not aware of the specific assaults made by the theosophical authors, the basic attitude towards Jesus, his message, and to all Christians who believe and follow him are consistent. So who is the god of the ancient mystery schools? The theosophical society is Luciferianism at its core. It is openly satanic in the case of Blavatsky, certainly Luciferianism in the case of Alice Bailey. They are exalting Lucifer. He is the god of this world, the planetary logos. He is the voice of God in the Bible, according to Alice Bailey. Lucifer is God. And I think that the New World Order philosophy and how that connects is clearly tied to Luciferianism, the exaltation of Lucifer as God, even if um, the lower levels of globalization in the New World Order only view that in terms of a principle. For example, the ideas of Prometheus and the light bearer and the torch and all these kinds of things that the Garden of Eden you know, thing was a good thing, that uh, knowledge was, was given to us and uh, by a great and awesome being, even if they only view it as sort of allegory, that idea 
is Luciferianism, the exaltation of Lucifer in the Bible as a good thing, even if they don't completely view him as God. So Luciferianism is the core of theosophical philosophy, and it's also the core of the New World Order, which again makes perfect sense to the overall thesis here that what they're doing is building up a, a, a platform to worship him. So, you have very high-ranking guys saying that they're worshiping Lucifer. And it's not just, you know, what we might think of as kind of simple Satanism, right? Where they go and they sort of worship Satan, I mean, that's all bad, right? But it's not very classy, let's put it that way. Whereas these other guys, the Masons, they've had this secret society for a very long time. They're very focused, they're well-to-do got a purpose, and they're very patient. They've been working on this for a long time. And of course, everybody at the lower levels doesn't really know what's going on. Right. It's only when you get to the 30, to the 33rd levels do you begin to understand what's going on. And even then, I think even if you get to the 33rd level, you're still somewhat deceived because you think Satan is actually the good guy. Right. You know? <laughs> so even the guys that, that know everything, so to speak, are still in the dark because Satan hasn't told them his true intentions, <clears throat> which is he doesn't care for anybody except himself. Ever since man realized that through special and exclusive knowledge comes power and the ability to rule over others, the ancient mystery teachings and the members who have access to this knowledge have been working in secrecy, which yields power and authority over the masses who have no idea that they are born into a highly organized systematic society being steered towards a fulfillment of their plan. Many have been blind victims helping continue the cycle of secrecy and deception while believing that they too were going to gain access to this knowledge. Sir, what is your problem? Just that, sir. Okay. I'm a Christian, sir. I'm pure and virtuous and wholesome and innocent. How can you say anything about it about me? Sir, you need to be born again. Is I that, am born again. Is that, now, did you just say that you are Lucifer? I am Lucifer. Okay, define Lucifer for me. Pure, virtuous, wholesome, innocent individual that's out to help people. Lucifer is? Yeah. Luc say that again. Lucifer is a pure, holy... Virtuous. Virtuous. Now, see the Lucifer that God created? That's the same one. Oh, man, this is great. I'm going to put this on the Internet. Oh, Amen. God bless you, Amen. brother. Because that's exactly what the Shriners and Masons teach, is that Lucifer, Lucifer is light. Sir? Jesus said, many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did not we did not do these good deeds in your name. And you'll say, away from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Jesus said it? In Matthew chapter 5. Mercy. No. That's hard to believe. So you're a Christian and you don't know that. Actually, no, I really am. You are. Because that, I'm pure and virtuous. You're pure and virtuous, okay. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In other words, you're perfect without Jesus, right? No, 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 no. Okay, tell me about Jesus. Who is Jesus? Oh. Well, he's, he's my leader. Is he the Son of God? Yes, he is. Is he the only worshipful master? Yes. Have you ever been called worshipful master? No, because I, I've just been too busy. I've been working. Yeah. <clears throat> See, this is what a mason confesses is that Lucifer is light. Yale University is 300 years old this year, and were you to visit its campus, you would see that it still has exotic clubhouses, which look like tombs where Yale's legendary secret societies meet. Their prestige and importance have largely evaporated, but the rituals are still a secret. And so when we heard that some enterprising characters had managed to spy on the famous Skull and Bone Society, we couldn't resist. Here's ABC's Dan Harris. The videotape provides a grainy glimpse into what appear to be the initiation rituals of a secret society that's been around since 1832, whose members have gone on to be leaders of Wall Street and the White House, the Senate and the Supreme Court. They're sort of trying to scare the initiates, make them, uh, you know, disorient them, frighten them. New York Observer investigative reporter Ron Rosenbaum accompanied a team of Yale students who shot these pictures nine days ago. Rosenbaum's curiosity about skull and bones 
was permanently peaked when, as a classmate of George W. Bush, he lived right next to the tomb, the group's heavily fortified home. From their perch, Rosenbaum and his cohorts taped the tomb's courtyard. What they captured, they say, was initiates, known as neophytes, being forced to kiss a skull. Then members performing a mock killing. There is a biblical explanation for the ancient mystery schools and the idea of resurrecting Atlantis. After the fall of mankind in the garden, God says something very interesting to Satan. This is the first prophecy recorded in the Bible. Her seed pertains to the coming Messiah who would free humanity from the bondage of sin of which Satan deceived humanity into accepting. It is also foreshadowing the virgin birth, since women are not the ones who carry the seed. This coming Messiah would bruise thy head, meaning he would defeat Satan and his work. God also mentions thy seed and how he will only bruise thy heel. This is the seed of Satan. Thus the counter move for Satan became clear. Disrupt the human genetic pool so that the pure bloodline of man will not bring forth the Messiah to redeem mankind. This is the reason for the flood. We find the account of this attempt to disrupt the human genetic code in Genesis 6. It reads, quote, When man began to multiply on the face of the land and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were attractive and they took as their wives any they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is flesh. His days shall be hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, the men of renown. End quote. The sons of God mentioned here in the Hebrew is pronounced Bene Ha Elohim. The Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the original Hebrew text, translates it as angels of God. They are clearly describing fallen angels. We know this because the Bible confirms this in 2 Peter 2.4 where it states, quote, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, end quote. And in Jude 1.6, where it states, quote, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day, end quote. Programs like Ancient Aliens on the History Channel have attempted to describe these sons of God as being aliens from outer space. This is wishful thinking. The reality is that these fallen angels were rebels to God and not some race of aliens from a faraway galaxy. In fact, the whole idea that there might be an alien race from outer space is part of the New World Order deception. We will get back to the UFO and an alien phenomenon a little bit later, but for now let's continue on with what the Bible says about these sons of God. What the passage portrays, and it's very difficult for many people to absorb this, it portrays fallen angels. These are not the good guys. Remember when Satan fell, a third of the angels fell with him. Not all of them, but a group of them, apparently, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, chose to try to create a hybrid race by cohabiting. By, I don't know the technology. Uh, I, I'm not going to get into that. But they apparently... Uh, uh, where, see, angels can't multiply. Angels are eternal. There's, uh, reproduction is a process for mortals. But at the same time, Satan's got a problem. A third of the angels fell with him, so he's got a deficiency of two to one in any war that comes. Right? He's got to find a, find a way to strengthen himself. This may be, this is just a, con a conjecture that floats around. Now, the offspring of Nephilim, they're also called the Hagibarim, the mighty ones. And... Uh, now, where the confusion starts to set in is when this Hebrew passage was translated into the Greek in the Septuagint, 
the word they used for the Nephilim was gigantes. It sounds like giants, and it turns out they were giants, but that's not what the word means. Gigantes comes from gigas, which means earthborn. So in the Hebrew, they're called the fallen ones. In the Greek, they're called the earthborn. The purpose of the flood was not just that there was sin in the land. There was, and that's emphasized. But if, if, if sin brings the flood, we better get some life jackets. No, there's something far deeper going on. That's what I want to sensitize you for when you do your own study and come to your own conclusions. But I want you to recognize there's something much more profound that God has a problem that God was solving. And that is that Satan's strategy was to contaminate the human race. Now that we know who these sons of God were, let's make the connection with the ancient mystery teachings. In order to do this, we must turn to a book which is referenced in the New Testament by Jesus, Peter, Paul, and Jude but are not in the current Bible as we have today. It is also a book that the early church fathers considered inspired, and certainly the audience of the early Israelites were well versed in and familiar with. I am speaking about the book of Enoch. I believe it is important to look at a book like Enoch and enhance our understanding of the Bible. I am not ready to say that it is inspired canon, but if it is referenced by so many in the New Testament, I believe it is worth investigating. The modern-day Christian scholars have largely put the Book of Enoch aside. As such, the book has been used by people who promote the ancient alien idea and folks like Zachariah Stitchin to present their theories of Nibiru and the Anunnaki. But in fact, the biblical foundation is the best fit for the Book of Enoch. So let's look at what it says. The first thing which is very interesting about the Book of Enoch is found in the beginning of the text. It states, quote, I heard everything from them and I understood what I saw, not for this family, but for a remote generation, one that is to come." End quote. It is interesting to note that the remnants of several almost complete copies of the Book of Enoch in Aramaic were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls in the middle of the 20th century. Furthermore, it is somewhat eerie to think that Enoch states the book is meant for future generations in light of what Jesus said of what will be the time of his return when he stated, quote, As the days of Noah were, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. This statement by Jesus will become more and more relevant as we continue to investigate what the days of Noah were like. The book of Enoch tells us several things, such as the number of fallen angels or watchers, where they landed, and what they taught mankind. It even lists the names of 20 of the fallen angels. But as it pertains to the mystery schools, it is very interesting the kinds of things that these watchers taught humanity. It states, quote, Azazel taught them to make swords, knives, shields, and breastplates, and made known to them metals and the skill of working them for bracelets and jewelry. Azazel also taught the use of antimony for coloring the eyelids, along with all types of precious stones and dye formulas. From this arose great disobedience. They were led astray. They committed immorality. They became corrupt in all their ways. Semyaza taught cursing and root cutting. Armeros cursed lifting. Barakoyel taught star signs. Kokabel star patterns. Ezekiel cloud lore. Arakiel land signs. Shamziel sun signs. And Sariel moon pathways." End quote. According to the Book of Enoch, this is the origin of the mystery schools. The fallen angels taught mankind weapon making and warfare, applying makeup and jewelry, introduced mankind to psychedelic drugs, vampirism, enchantments and cursings, as well as astrology. It is quite remarkable to see how much of what these watchers taught not only relate to the ancient mystery religions, but are common everyday things of the world we live in today. We even see the Watchers teach mankind the art of abortion. Quote, the fifth was Kasdea. This is he who showed the Yaladim A'am all the evil strikings of unclean Rakim and demonic entities. He showed them the dashing of the embryo in the womb so that it would die. End quote. 
The Book of Enoch also states that the Watchers began to mix animals and humans together. Quote, they started to sin against birds, beasts, reptiles, fish, and then to devour one another's bodies, even drinking the blood. It was then the earth laid accusation against these lawless ones. End quote. The book of Jasher, another ancient text referenced several times in the Bible, which also records the nefarious acts of the fallen angels, confirms, quote, Then the sons of men began teaching the mixture of animals of one species with the other, in order therewith to provoke the Lord, end quote. This is extremely interesting because it is information which would have sounded absurd until the last half century. It is not talking about hybridization, but of creating creatures that go beyond their own kind as God created man, animals, and plants. This tells us a couple of things. One, that the technology they had was far greater than we can ever imagine. This is confirmed in the book of Ecclesiastes in the Bible where it states, quote, What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun, end quote. No matter how far we think we've come in the name of science and technology, it seems we are only catching up to what we were taught by these fallen angels in the antediluvian or pre-flood world. Two, the creatures we see in several ancient mythologies such as centaurs and minotaurs could all be attributed from what these fallen angels did on the earth. Steve Quayle, in his book Genesis 6 Giants, summarizes this idea, stating, quote, the collective memories in the form of myths, fables, and fairy tales from various cultures and ages of mankind are overwhelming evidence that the Nephilim existed. End quote. I believe that the antediluvian world of fallen angels, hybrids, warfare, Nephilim, astrology, advanced technology, and false spirituality is Atlantis. As theosophists and esoteric authors of the last century wrote, how they believe the mystery schools began in Atlantis, I believe that the antediluvian world and the teachings of these fallen angels are the same thing. This makes sense to what the elite and secret societies are trying to do to forge a new world order today. Not only are they trying to rediscover Atlantis, but in doing so, they are merely attempting to fulfill the ancient hope which has been at work since the days of Adam and Eve the earthly rule of the Antichrist. The truth certainly seems stranger than fiction. But she can tell you she's never seen anything. You gotta see it for yourself. These residents are sort of like covering the sky about my The North Canton couple was trying to figure out what it was that they saw in the sky of their home just a few days ago. Mysterious, unexplained, orange-colored objects. And they tell us that they saw lights, but those lights were not from an airplane or a helicopter. And these lights dropped something as they hung low over the sky. Mike was in the Air Force and says the lights hovering in the sky were unlike any he had seen. What the jet was really moved for this in the cell, it was one of those. The first fantasy was the guy that was from the East.
us another one. What? 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 Topics of interest the New Age movement has harnessed through the infiltrating of the truth movement has been on the topic of UFOs and ETs. Many of these folks, like David Wilcock, David Icke, Jordan Maxwell, and many others, have in fact verified the concept that the UFO phenomenon is not necessarily flesh and blood beings, but are a race of highly evolved spiritual entities who have attained what we refer to as godhood and power over the elements of nature and physics of which we are currently limited to. This is eerily similar to the sacred promise given to the inner members of the New World Order. It is also the same concept being promoted by transhumanists and the road to attain singularity and human immortality through the use of technology in the field of biology and genetics. I believe that all of these various tentacles are leading to the same place and the same goal. More people today believe that there is life outside of Earth than ever before. A 2008 Scripps UFO poll conducted by Thomas Hargrove and Guido H. Stample showed that over 74% of 18-24 to 24 year olds believed it was likely that intelligent life exists on other planets. This is perhaps due to several factors including our current growth in scientific knowledge and understanding of the size and vastness of the universe but also the propaganda perpetuated by our media. Science fiction has exploded in America and the world as a staple theme for films, movies, books, and video games. Could this all be part of the plan to prepare the world for disclosure? I think the New Age, as well as the mainstream sort of media, and I mean like movies and television shows, and everybody's been shoving this alien UFO thing down our throats because it has so many uses for the Antichrist system. I've said many times, I don't know if this is the way that it will all be set up. It is just a really convenient way if it does go down like this because it does do three main things that are needed for the Antichrist system. Number one, it causes the world to reject God. Uh, we've been sold this erroneous idea that if aliens exist, then God doesn't. So the headlines the day after would read, you know, God proven wrong or whatever. The whole world would be united in its rejection of God overnight. So that certainly would play in, obviously, to the biblical account of this this uh, world order at the end of time. Also, we would believe ourselves to be God. This one would take a little bit longer to sink in, but the idea that aliens, in a real sort of evolution kind of way, just evolved, and that uh, you know that it could be sold to us that they were somehow our creators in the sense that they genetically modified us, or they might have some excuse to the 
origin of life or something to that effect. Uh, ultimately, we would see them as gods in the sense of their perhaps abilities or their technological advancement. And it really depends on this point of how and what they say about us, if they say anything, or if in the discovering of them that uh, it is implied in some way that uh, that we ourselves could be like them and therefore like gods. And that really goes into the third part, which is the evolution. I think that this concept of evolution is crucial to so much of what the Antichrist system does, especially the, the genocide based on belief system that happens in the end uh, time scenario, uh, really requires, as it did in the Third Reich, uh, an idea of evolution. There was a, there's a concept that um, you know, there's certain people that are not uh, fit for the new, the new system, the new evolution. They were, they, they were sort of helping humanity evolve by the elimination of those that weren't ready for the new age, the new world. Uh, Hitler believed in the fifth root race of Blavatsky, but yet I think this new system is going to have a very unique version of evolution. And of course, the appearance of aliens really validates that on a worldwide scale. No longer do you have to you know, have this sort of underground preaching of theosophy as it was in, in Hitler's time, but rather the whole world is united in this understanding or perceived understanding of potential evolution coming. After all, the aliens are here. We can be like them. They just simply evolved like we have the potential to do. We can become like them. We can communicate telepathically or whatever as long as we are willing to take that next step. And there's this great precipice that we're you know now at this able this ability to move to this next level but it's all going to be in the context of you know god has just recently been disproven but yet there will be people on earth that can't quite go with the new system because they're stuck in the old paradigm of god does exist and the bible was accurate and these aliens are a deception those people will be presented as enemy number one and and will be viewed as the thing that's holding us back from the potential evolution UFOs and ETs in the Bible? Interesting question. Uh, we got to define our terms right. a little bit, I think, right? So, uh, in as far as there were sons of God coming down, there were demons coming down, then yes, there are aliens, because the demons of yesterday are today's aliens. That's really the bottom line. Uh, there are not aliens from some distant galaxy or from the Pleiades system or anything like that. They are very much from here. They're demonic. So, in as far as there were demons, then then yes. But you know, we we can't call them demons or gods from yesteryear because that's really out of fashion. Mm -hmm. But you can call them aliens because now they're from some other place and they evolved. It's interesting how evolution has served as such a foundation for this. Mm -hmm. You know, God. I mean, the the demons. Satan gets us thinking that there is no God, that there is so no Satan or any demons. But then he starts replacing it with these other entities. And we believe in evolution, you know, lots of people do. And so that serves as the foundation for these otherworldly beings that have also evolved, not by God, mind you. But they're, they're, you know, they've evolved from a long time ago. And as far as UFOs, well, UFO is an unidentified flying object. Um, and we're seeing those today. People are seeing those all over the place. And generally what they look like is just some kind of a, a white light. It's a white ball of light or something like this that's floating around in the sky. And people will say, oh, it's a kite. Now we can all see what a kite looks like. They're not helicopters. We know what hel helicopters look like. We're not stupid, right? Neither are the people that take all these videos. And, and you can watch them on YouTube. And yeah. there's just thousands of them. And, uh, you know, I'm sure there's a few pranksters out there, right? But sure, but, but still, just the, the quantity and even the quality of the video is such that you're like, wow, that's really amazing. Um, so in the Old Testament, you find places where the heavens were opened. For example, in 2 Kings chapter 6, Elijah and his servant are surrounded by the Syrians. They wake up one morning and the servant goes outside and he sees all these guys. He's like, oh boy. He goes back and he says, Master, we're done. And Elijah, you know, he's just very calm and he prays, oh Lord, I pray you'd open his eyes. And so God opens the young man's eyes and he looks all around him and he sees these horses and chariots of fire. 
Now that's interesting. Why would God need to use chariots of fire? Well, I don't know the answer. I mean, you'd think you could just go, you know, kind of Star Trek kind of thing. You know, just you go from here to there. But for some reason, in that other dimension, you have horses of fire. You have these chariots of fire, and these things are are going around. And in some way, I would suspect that the demons are kind of do the same thing. I don't know if they're on horses of fire necessarily, but they're mater- when they materialize, they look like these these fiery white orbs, and you know however they're transporting themselves, I don't know, but it's not like they can just think it and they're there. But they have to somewhat travel, they have to traverse through whatever medium, the spiritual medium or through the the physical medium, they're actually moving about. So again. I, I wouldn't say that we have, you know, what we call technical UFOs back then, but you did have these horses and chariots of fire in that angelic spiritual realm. There's movement going on. Uh, angels have wings. Again, why would they have wings? Right? Is there air in that? It's, these are questions we just don't know. Right. You know, we we still know the answer to these things. But still, there's a function for these things. If they have wings, then they must need them. If there are horses and chariots of fire, then they must need those in some capacity that I don't understand. And we're not really told, but still, there it is. So, um, what we're seeing today is a resurgence. It, we're, we're really, we're just, we're, I don't know so much a resurgence, we're seeing a breakthrough of that realm into our own. And, and, and those demons are coming through, somehow they're being able to manifest in this realm, I don't know how they do that, but they're doing it. They're manifesting, and they're up in the skies. Um, I mean, millions of people have seen these things. Right. Uh, you even have sort of uh, more famous people like Ronald Reagan. Mm-hmm. He claimed to have seen something a number of times. Jimmy Carter, mm-hmm. uh, Barry Goldwater, um, Douglas MacArthur. All right, just to name a few of the presidents, you have other world leaders. You have uh, Michio Kaku, who's a real famous uh, physicist. Let me make a prediction, and that is sometime by mid-century, we might make contact with an intelligent civilization in outer space. Plus you have, you know, just lots and lots of astronauts. They say that every time that we had a, a mission, we were being followed by something. We were being watched. We saw some craft. We saw something. Right, and you can you can watch some of these videos that have been released by NASA, and you can see these, these things out there. Right, so there's definitely something out there. The question is, what is it? Scholars with no religious affiliation who have looked into this topic of UFOs and ETs for several decades have come to very interesting conclusions. Jack Vallee, a venture capitalist, computer scientist, author, ufologist, and former astronomer who helped build the precursor to what we know as the internet, has studied the UFO phenomenon for over three decades. After looking into the relationship between UFOs, cults, religious movements, demons, angels, ghosts, and psychic phenomenon, Vallee changed his proposed hypothesis from the UFO phenomenon being an extraterrestrial origin, in other words, craft and beings from another planet or a faraway galaxy, to a multi-dimensional visitation hypothesis, or interdimensional. In his book, Messengers of Deception, Valet states, quote, Human beings are under the control of a strange force that bends them in absurd ways, forcing them to play a role in a bizarre game of deception, end quote. Later in the same book, he states, quote, The UFO phenomenon represents a manifestation of a reality that transcends our current understanding of physics, the UFOs are physical manifestations that cannot be understood apart for their psychic and symbolic reality. What we see in effect here is not an alien invasion. It is a control system which acts on humans and uses humans." End quote. J. Allen Hynek, a U.S. astronomer, professor, and ufologist best remembered for his contributions in the field of UFOs and acting as scientific advisor to UFO studies taken by the U.S. Air Force again came to same conclusions of the UFOs and alleged extraterrestrial phenomenon. In his book, Edge of Reality, he states, quote, 
If UFOs are somebody else's nuts and bolts hardware, then we must still explain how such tangible hardware can change shape before our eyes, vanish in a Cheshire cat manner, not even leaving a grin, seemingly melt away in front of us, or apparently materialize mysteriously before us without apparent detection by persons nearby or in neighboring towns. We must wonder too where UFOs are hiding when not manifesting themselves to human eyes." End quote. The overall consensus seems to be that these crafts which are being seen have the ability to manifest as physical objects and at the same time manipulate time and space as to become invisible or perform aerial maneuvers that defy our current understanding of physics and nature. The deeper side to this phenomenon are the abduction accounts recorded by millions of people all over the world, regardless of time, race, culture, and upbringing. Dr. John Mack, professor at Harvard Medical School, a psychiatrist and writer, also looked into the UFO and abduction phenomenon for several decades and came to similar conclusions as Valet and Hynek. Although he recently passed away, his contributions to the study of ufology and alien abductions is highly touted and greatly respected. He states in an interview with Nova Online when asked if the phenomenon is literally physical or psychological, stating, quote, Yes, it's both. It's both literally physically happening to a degree, and it's also some kind of psychological, spiritual experience occurring and originating perhaps in another dimension. And so the phenomenon stretches us, or it asks us to stretch to open to realities that are not simply the literal physical world, but to extend to a possibility that there is other unseen realities from which our consciousness, our, if you will, learning processes, over the past several hundred years have closed us off." End quote. So it seems to be the case is they come from some other domain, some place, maybe not another star or maybe from another dimension, but they manifest, they show up here in our physical world. People have a number of cases where people are just playing gone, a child comes into the mother's room, mom, you weren't there during the night when I came. There is burned earth outside where the ships have landed. There is physical, it may not satisfy our criteria of proof, but proof may be something which only operates within the frame of evidence of this physical world in the box you mentioned before right. that we live in. This is what's going on here is something in some ways more subtle. In other words, something coming from another dimension into our world, which is very commonly experienced in other cultures, but not in this culture. Uh, John Mack, who recently passed away, but he was at Harvard, and you know, according to his own testimony, he says, you know, I was not a believer in this thing, he didn't, he wasn't trying to prove anything, he just kept hearing about these things, so, and so he came to this conclusion that they were, these were real physical abductions, very, very slowly he came to that conclusion, and rather skeptically, he didn't want to come to that conclusion, but eventually the data was so much that he could not overcome it. And he had to just say, well, it's happening. Something physical is happening. Dr. David Jacobs uh, did, has done similar research. He was quite upbeat about this whole thing for a long time. But in the last several years, he's become very downcast about his discoveries because he's discovering that these beings that are taking people are smarter than us, they're stronger than us, and they're, they have a, a hybridization program going on that they're creating a hybrid race to take over and he says at best we're going to be second class serfs so he's very discouraged and I can see why you know I think if, if you cut if you discover these things and yet you don't understand that there's a greater power which is Jesus Christ who has a much better plan then I would be extremely depressed <laughs> you know I mean and the way I'm sort of upbeat about the whole thing because I see that we are getting very close to right. the end. Right. But it's also getting scary. I mean, yeah. there's just crazy things going on. Dr. David Jacob, an associate professor of history at Temple University, specializing in 20th century American history and culture, has also studied the UFO and abduction phenomenon for over 40 years. In an interview with L.A. Marzulli in the book Alien Interviews, Jacobs comments on the alien abduction phenomenon, stating, quote, this is a phenomenon that is either psychological or it is happening. There is very little in the middle. 
I have learned that the abduction phenomenon is vast, global, and it occurs with great frequency, end quote. Whitley Strieber, in his classic account of an alien encounter in the book Communion, records his experience with these entities, stating, quote, I became entirely given over to extreme dread. The fear was so powerful that it seemed to make my personality become evaporate. Whitley ceased to exist. What was left was a body in a state of raw fear so great that it swept about me like a thick, suffocating curtain, turning paralysis into a condition that seemed close to death. I died and a wild animal appeared in my place." End quote. Then in a later release in a book entitled Transformation, The Breakthrough, he dives deeper into the experience, stating, quote, "...increasingly I felt as if I were entering a struggle that might even be more than life and death. It might be a struggle for my soul, my essence, or whatever part of me might have reference to the eternal. There are worse things than death, I suspected. So far, the word demon has never been spoken among the scientists and doctors who are working with me. Alone at night, I worried about the legendary cunning of demons. At the very least, I was going stark, raving mad." End quote. Then later in the same book, he states, quote, I felt an absolutely indescribable sense of menace. It was hell on earth to be there in the presence of these entities. And yet I couldn't move, couldn't cry out, couldn't get away. I lay as still as death, suffering inner agonies. Whatever was there seemed so monstrously ugly, so filthy and dark and sinister. Of course they were demons, they had to be, and they were here and I couldn't get away." End quote. According to many researchers in the field, and even the people who have directly experienced this phenomenon for themselves, all seem to agree that there is a spiritual element driving this phenomenon. It is clear that there is a metaphysical nature to the UFOs and the alien abductions themselves. Furthermore, the startling similarities with the phenomenon with the occult and other historical mythological accounts of direct contact with demonic entities should be alarming. Jack Vallee alludes to this concept, stating, quote, The symbolic display seen by the abductees is identical to the type of initiation ritual or astral voyage that is embedded in the occult traditions of every culture. The structure of abduction stories is identical to that of occult initiation rituals. The UFO beings of today belong to the same class of manifestation as the occult entities that were described in centuries past." End quote. There is another angle to this phenomenon that is seldom discussed, but is very important to point out. That is the solution to help stop those who experience the alien abduction phenomenon. Joe Jordan, director and field investigator for MUFON, through his investigation at CE4 Research Group, has discovered that calling upon the name of Jesus Christ during the abduction can make the experience stop instantly. On their website, ce4research.com, the mission statement states, quote, the mission of CE4 Research Group is to share with the world the most powerful evidence known that exposes the alien entities for who they really are. The evidence is in the testimony of those who have overcome the experience, the oppression, the bondage, the harassment, the control, the lies, the deception that these entities perpetuate by calling out in the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Through this evidence of these testimonies, we will be able to help others. The world asks for this evidence, and we will give it to them." End quote. A lot of the people that have seen my videos know my testimony of how it all started with one book on a vacation trip to visit my brother. I picked up one book, UFO Crash at Roswell, and uh, it was like opening a doorway into something that would totally change my life. And uh, it has, and it's changed a number of times since then, but that one started it. it. It put me on a quest to find out what this UFO phenomenon was about. And like I said, I came into it as uh, an agnostic with an open mind and what I thought was total objectivity and became a MUFON investigator. I was doing UFO investigations, sighting investigations for a few years and then got caught up in uh, what is called the New Age belief system and metaphysical studies because, you know, it's part of this UFO phenomenon. It goes hand in hand. I was caught up in all of that too and it changed my worldview again. Uh, from being, you know, an agnostic humanist to one who was into the New Age and actually practicing these metaphysical studies myself. And uh, I was able to see the UFO phenomenon through another set of eyes. And then in 1996, um, I was 
shown the true gospel uh, where I had actually caught my attention and uh, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior in November of 1996 and now I was able to look at this phenomenon in yet another set of eyes so initially was this what I was looking for no it was not well the first case I came across I actually had interviewed this gentleman who claimed to have had an abduction experience along with other sighting experiences and um, other what he felt were abduction experiences too but he taught we decided to interview him and this was six months before I became a Christian um, this was in the middle of 1996 that we did the interview with him and I used to come to my monthly meetings my MUFON meetings that I had and he just wanted to share what he had been through you know and he was had a, an interest because of his experiences in the UFO phenomena and uh, myself and one of my lead investigators uh, actually my partner that helped me found CE4 very in the very beginning uh, his name was Wes Clark he was a very good investigator worked for the Space Center at the time as a quality inspector and uh, he had a good organizational skill of helping do these investigations and him and I interviewed this gentleman in his home for two hours on videotape and just let him talk and we asked some questions and would guide him along just to try to get all of his information well we put it away and we didn't see anything unusual at the time and that was interesting in itself that we didn't catch this but when I became a believer in my in November of 96 I was ready to put all of this away because God showed me what this UFO the experience was about that it, there was a evil demonic side to it and uh, I felt that as a new Christian and wanting to do uh, the things that God asked of me that we shouldn't be involved in this and I put it away and God says no I got plans for you and you need to take the this message back to you know the, where you came from and I said you know I can't take the Word of God back to these new age people Mm -hmm. uh, I said, they don't believe it to be the inerrant word of God. As a matter of fact, they don't even be, believe in God being a personal, you know, being, an entity that they can relate to. So I said, you got to give me something better. And nobody told me that as a new Christian, you don't talk to God like that. But uh, I did, not knowing any better. <laughs> and he answered and he says, uh, guess what? You already have it. You just haven't seen it and I couldn't understand what that meant at first so I asked my partner Wes who was a Christian at the time but, and uh, I said we've got something here somewhere uh, that we need to go back and look at we went back and looked at some of the cases that we had and we pulled this particular one back out it was a gentleman named Bill D we pulled his video back out plugged it into the VCR and sat back and started watching and went oh my do you remember hearing this? And Wes mm -hmm. says, I don't. And we were sitting right there watching the gentleman and listening to him. But yet we were blinded and deafened at the time we did the recording. Mm -hmm. Nothing registered until this time when God said, go back and look. You already have it. And what he shared was an experience, atypical, abduction-type experience, um, where he had been taken experience being taken and immediately panicked and in fear and he himself actually just being a brand new Christian called out during this panic experience in saying Jesus Jesus help me and when he did that in an instant the experience abruptly stopped and he felt like he was thrown back into his bed he even startled his wife she asked him why he was jumping on the bed and uh, he said you know when he shared that experience he didn't understand what it meant and when we heard that we knew we had something because never before in all the studies we had done of the other work that the top researchers had done in the country you know this was 15 years ago um, the big names never before had anybody said that an experience could be stopped as a matter of fact they would they all said that it wasn't possible to stop an experience mm -hmm. okay 
but yet we had a gentleman that said he did and in a particular way so i contacted the, these top researchers around the country got their home phones called them up they're nice guys they can talk you can talk to them just like me and you were talking most of them are very nice gentlemen and i've met them at the conferences over the years and uh, i said guys i've got a very unusual case here i'd like to run it by you and see what you think and uh, after i shared the story they all asked can we go off the record and i said well that's fine i said uh, i'm just trying to get answers here well when i say go off the record that means i can't tell you who said what but i can tell you what they said well these guys uh they said that yes we had come across similar cases where people had cried out in the name of jesus or had quoted scripture or had sung a christian hymn and the experience stopped and i said really and i said first off I've never read anywhere where you guys have said that an experience can even be stopped. And in second, I've never read where you stated where they could be stopped in any type of manner like this. And I said, "Why is that?" And one of two answers or both answers would come out from each of these researchers. The first one was pretty common amongst them was we didn't know what to make of it. <laughs> and, but you know what? I would have been fine with that because to me that was an honest answer i mean i didn't know what to make of it either in the beginning mm -hmm. so i i could relate to them on that answer but they always would follow it with a second answer and it was we were afraid to go there meaning the spiritual side of this mm -hmm. because it might affect our credibility in the ufo realm so huh. what i was seeing is they had research evidence part of the ufo puzzle that we've all been trying to put together but they chose not to share it because of it might of it affecting their credibility not that it was getting to the truth or it was completing an entire puzzle but because of personal issues personal mm. agendas and you know what that's called it's called a cover up throughout the ufo community you hear government cover up this government cover up that but i'm telling you from experience in dealing with this type of case that there's been a cover up all along by the researchers in this ufo community phenomenon that are supposedly giving us the truth and the answers to this experience it's coming from them because they've got personal agendas they only want to share certain things you know and if you ever follow these conferences that are going on out there it's like they never give you the whole thing you know you get little bits and pieces and i guess it's part of keeping you busy coming to their conferences you know but i've been sharing the same message for years now the same evidence and it still disturbs them there are several testimonies on CE4research.com and I encourage anyone who has either been affected by the phenomenon or know someone who has to take a look at this research. It is much too important not to. In an article on HearkenTheWatchman.com entitled Demons or Extraterrestrials Tremble at the Name of Jesus Christ, Dr. Stephen Eulish comes to the same conclusion stating, quote, I believe in UFOs and extraterrestrials. I do not believe that either I am delusional or am I hallucinating. I do believe that the government is covering up these phenomena even though they are being bewitched as to its real meaning. This deception is part of the spiritual war between God and Satan. These are therefore serious topics." End quote. We have crossed the Pleiadians and as we've said, it is uh, our pleasure to be here at this time to communicate with you, to give you an opportunity to understand our energy and who we are. This one that speaks through us, we call her our vehicle. She has given you uh, an opportunity to listen to her interpretation of what she feels is taking place as a result of our contact with her. 
not even a speck of a speck. Yet humans live their lives as though they are as big as gods. Allow us to communicate an idea to you, once again, that we would like to call the span. This involves the idea of a span of time and timing <clears throat> that is now upcoming on your planet. Although many direct experiences with these entities do seem to entail dread and negativity, there are plenty of accounts of positive experiences. Most of these experiences are found within the New Age movement, where the experiences are not direct physical contact, but rather spiritual through a process called channeling. This is where the person willingly invites entities who are referred to as the Higher Self, Ascended Masters, Higher Spiritual Beings, Extraterrestrial Entities who are communicating telepathically, Entities of Higher Densities, and a number of other alleged beings who are more evolved than human beings. Most of the quotes we've looked at in an earlier section of the ancient mystery schools and theosophy were all channeled information. In the case of Helena Blavatsky, the entity she channeled was named Kutumi and El Mura, both of whom were considered ascended masters from northern India and Tibet. Alice Bailey channeled the entity Dejwal Kul, also considered an ascended master. Today there are several New Age teachers who claim to get their information from a source of a higher spiritual origin. David Icke claims he channeled entities he refers to as the guides. And one great example of the way this works I came across, which the, 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 the beings, which we, we call the guys, uh, told us about. You call them the guys? The, gu the guys, yeah. It's, mm. it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's not... Um, it's not like, like the beings like... Uh, uh, Taro, Rakowski. And, yeah, yeah, that's right. right. Yeah. Now, he uh, was Jesus' father, Rakowski. That's right. And he, Merlin as well. Part of him was, yeah. yeah. That's right. The, the aspects. David Wilcock claims he channeled an entity named Ra. I... It is an honor and a privilege to greet you this day in the love and in the light of the one infinite creator. Resonant raindrops of liquid light cascading down in a panoply of shapes and colors unbeknownst to the conscious mind. More and more people are beginning to claim that they are channeling well. A certain aspect of Christianity in that organized religion that really belabors, and I don't mean that in a negative way, but the suffering um, that Jesus may or may not have um, experienced while he was on the cross. And in meditation about two years ago, he actually um, came to me in meditation. I wasn't asking for him to come forward. Um, but it was a very, very powerful experience where he actually allowed me to feel what it was like on the cross. Um, I could, I mean, I was looking down and could see the, um, the pin in my feet as they were crossed and I was just, it was so emotional, but I felt and experienced no pain mm -hmm. that was associated with it. This is very similar to mediumship and psychics who claim to be able to contact the dead through telepathic means. It is quite clear that the Bible explicitly prohibits the practice of divination, mediumship, and other spiritual practices which allow one to have direct contact with entities from another realm. In Deuteronomy 18, 10 through 11, it states, quote, let no one be found among you who sacrifices his son or daughter in the fire, who practices divination or sorcery, interprets omens, engages in witchcraft or casts spells, or who is a medium or spiritist or who consults the dead." End quote. But why is this so? Plenty of people who channel or have what are called gifts are happy with their ability to do so and would even go as far as to say that God gave them this ability for a greater purpose to help the world. It is my firm belief that God can take any situation and turn it into good. However, like most things in the Bible that God tells us not to do, He is only doing so to keep us from harm. The problem with channeling is that there is no way to know whether these entities which are being contacted are from God, as some suggest, or are counterfeits, in other words, demons working for Satan. 
It states in 2 Corinthians 11, 14 through 15, quote, And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising, then, if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve, end quote. Then in 1 John 4, 1 through 3, it states, quote, Dear friends, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. This is how you can recognize the Spirit of God. Every spirit that acknowledges that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God, but every spirit that does not acknowledge Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and even now is already in the world. End quote. God is not in it to try to take away abilities or keep us from enjoying the likes of astral projection, outer body experiences, remote viewing, and other such alleged abilities that are so common and popular in the New Age just because he is cruel and acting as a cosmic police officer. Rather, he is simply giving us warnings and informing us to test the spirits so that we can be sure it is from God to protect us from deceiving spirits who are in it to draw our attention away from God and away from Jesus and ultimately away from the true message of salvation. How many of these folks who channel entities actually exercise this basic principle? And for those who claim they are channeling Jesus Christ, well, I suppose it's possible, but in my opinion, not very likely. Why would Jesus go directly against his own teachings to send a message to someone? The bottom line is that we ourselves can have a direct relationship with Jesus, not through channeling, but through a life of prayer. Prayer is not channeling. The key difference is that with prayer, we ourselves are humble, coming before God, speaking to him directly as ourselves. With channeling, one's own body and mind are taken over where the entity enters the physical body to deliver a message. Again, this is very similar to a demonic possession. Demons do not have bodies. In fact, they seek to enter objects or the physical body as hosts. This is seen all over the Bible. On several accounts, the Bible speaks of demon-possessed people. In Mark chapter 5, a demon-possessed man replies to Jesus when asked what their name is, stating, quote, my name is Legion, he replied, for we are many, end quote. In Luke 4.35, we see Jesus casting out demons, where it states, quote, Be quiet, Jesus said sternly, come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him, end quote. Later we see disciples of Jesus casting out demons in his name, quote, The seventy-two returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name, end quote. And in Luke 11:14, Jesus drives out another demon, stating, quote, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. When the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed, end quote. The dangers of channeling are that you are allowing deceiving spirits enter into your body. It is dangerous not only for your own soul, but for others around you, such as friends and family. The danger is that it can lead to demonic possession and strongholds. It is my firm belief that exorcisms do not need to be performed exclusively by Catholic priests as most believe, but can be done by those who have been saved by Jesus Christ. Many in deliverance ministries do this very thing under the name and authority of Jesus Christ. Are the entities and alien abductions, spiritual beings and channeling and meditation, and straight up evil demons one and the same? I would say yes. As we just saw, it's not hard to convince anyone that these demonic spirits are evil and are of the Antichrist. However, the other spirits that appear as angels of light may be more difficult to discern, especially the alleged ETs that seem to have a positive message to mankind. But let's look at the specific messages people received from alleged aliens and higher spiritual entities. David Wilcox supposedly channeled an entity named Ra. In his New Age ministry, he points to a book called The Law of One as an authoritative document which he claims is much more in tune with the truth than the Bible. The same entity, Ra, which Wilcock claims he channeled, was channeled through Carla Ruckart in the early 1980s and was documented in The Law of One. Let's look at what The Law of One has to say about Jesus Christ, the Bible, and Christianity. Upon asking who or what Jesus Christ is, Ra explained, quote, I am Ra, the one known to you as Jesus of Nazareth, did not have a name. This entity was a member of fifth density of the highest level of the sub-octave. The particular mind-body-spirit complex you call Jesus is, as what you would call an entity, not to return except as a member of the confederation speaking through a channel. 
However, there are others of the identical congruency of consciousness that will welcome those to the fourth density. This is the meaning of the returning. The entity was absolved karmically of the destruction of an other self when it was in the last portion of lifetime and spoke upon what you would call a cross, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In forgiveness lies the stoppage of the wheel of action, or what you call karma." End quote. So if we are to test the spirit in accordance to what we are told in 1 John, it confirms that Ra felt that Jesus was not God in the flesh, but simply another entity of higher spiritual levels, just like Ra and other ascended masters who chose to become part of the human race. This is a clever twisting in a deceptive way to deny Jesus' deity. Another interesting thing I noticed in the channeled writings of Ra was that not only did this supposed entity rarely use the name of Jesus in response to the questions about Jesus, but every time it did, it always referenced him by starting off with the one you call or the one it calls or as you call this entity now. In other words, never was this entity able to directly say Jesus Christ. It always had to set it up so as to defer his deity. Ra goes on to explain his opinion of Christianity when he states, quote, Another example well known in your culture is the visualization in your mass of the distortion of the love of the one infinite creator called Christianity, wherein a small portion of your foodstuffs is seen to be a mentally configured but entirely real man, the man known to you as Jehoshua, or as you call this entity now, Jesus." End quote. Once again, it claims the falseness of Christianity, calling it a distortion of the love of the one infinite creator. This again demonstrates the denial of uniqueness of Jesus Christ as the one and only savior for mankind, fully God, fully human. The Star Doves, another group who claims to have channeled spiritual entities named masters or gods, describes Jesus in yet another form. They state, quote, Perhaps it may be new to some souls to learn that Maitreya overshadowed Jesus the Christ in his lifetime. Yet there is another great soul who is of prime importance in this plan the masters know and serve. That being is Sananda, our star commander in chief. End quote. This is alarming because Maitreya is the new age in Theosophists' Christ. Many members of the United Nations and other world leaders are also earnestly seeking the arrival of the supposed world teacher who allegedly is going to be a spiritual leader to help humanity usher in the new age. For more details on Maitreya, I encourage you to check out Aquarius, The Age of Evil by Keith Thompson. Furthermore, in an alleged channeling of this entity known to the star doves as Jesus Sananda, apparently described his second coming by stating, quote, I speak in the name of Jesus, Lord of this world, and of all which concerns this earth sphere. I am he who is known as the Christ, and through this channel announce my coming unto earth once more. I am Sananda of the hierarchical board, known on earth through my last incarnation frequency as Jesus the Christ, Lord of this world, and of the planet known as earth." End quote. What's interesting is that Jesus never claimed to be the Lord of this world. This is verified in John 18:36, where Jesus states, quote, My kingdom is not of this world, end quote. The Bible is also clear that Satan is actually the ruler of this world. This is shown in many ways in the Bible, one of which is found in Matthew 4, 8, where it states, quote, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said to him, All these I will give to you if you will fall down and worship me, end quote. The star doves also claim to actually have an encounter with Sananda slash Jesus. Quote, On August 14th, 1997, I was taken up in my light body by Sananda slash Jesus to the mothership Sangre de Cristo, his Starfleet headquarters for the second coming plan the masters know and serve. End quote. All of these claims, again, go against the standards set by 1 John. The claim that Jesus was not God in the flesh and that he was somehow communicating with these people without their testing of these spirits. It should be obvious that this claim of Jesus is also different from the claims made by Ra in the Law of One channelings, confirming further that these are nothing more than deceiving spirits. In a very popular book entitled A Course in Miracles, penned by Helen Skuckman, said she channeled what she called an inner voice, which claims was Jesus. But after studying the material and the metaphysical nature of the message, it is quite clear that this could not have been Jesus Christ as we know through the biblical accounts. 
Here are just a few quotes from A Course in Miracles that show its true nature. On page 9, it states, quote, There is no sin. On page 10, it states, quote, A slain Christ has no meaning. On page 12, it states, quote, Do not make the pathetic error of clinging to the old rugged cross. And on page 13, it states, quote, The name of Jesus as such is but a symbol. It is a symbol that is safe placement for the many names of all the gods to which you pray. As if the denial of sin, Jesus, and the cross was not enough, A Course in Miracles goes on to claim that there is no devil either, stating, quote, You have created in your mythology the being you call devil. You have even imagined a god at war with this being. Of course, a real devil does not exist. Using psychic ability is nothing more than using your sixth sense, not trafficking with the devil. There is no devil, each to his own without judgment." End quote. In an article posted on mountainstreampress.org, Warren B. Smith came to the same conclusion that the Jesus being promoted by A Course of Miracles was in fact the spirit of the Antichrist and not the true Jesus Christ. He stated, quote, My conclusions were inescapable and shocking. A Course in Miracles and the Bible were two completely different thought systems that were mutually exclusive and diametrically opposed in every degree. To my utter amazement, A Course in Miracles was the Holy Bible turned upside down. The Course had not updated or reinterpreted the Bible. It had completely rewritten it, end quote. In another book written by Levi H. Dowling called The Aquarian Gospel of Jesus Christ, the claims are similar in the denial of Jesus' deity by stating that we are all becoming Christ's. Levi claims he was able to access the Akashic Records, which is allegedly an ethereal network of intelligence that surrounds the atmosphere of the Earth and can be accessed through the spirit or our light body. This is the same place Edgar Cayce claims he received all of his information from as well. In this account, Jesus is not so much denied, but again, painted as a mystical master who had special abilities who simply came to show mankind how to live and become Christ's ourselves. Here is a list of claims made by the book as summarized on Wikipedia. Number 1. Jesus puts on the role of the Christ but is not automatically Christ by nature. By making himself through effort and prayer a fit vessel, Jesus enabled the Christ to dwell within him. Christ is therefore used as a term for a perfect human being that Jesus exemplified, a human being that has been christened, anointed, and therefore made holy. 2. Reincarnation exists and is the explanation for various seeming injustices. Reincarnation allows people to settle debts they have incurred in past lives. Number 3. Humanity has forgotten God and is currently working its way back to fully remembering God. Number 4. Time is separated into ages. These ages last approximately 2,000 years. We are now nearing the start of the Aquarian Age. Number 5. All souls will eventually mature and become perfect, like Jesus, thus ending the cycle of reincarnation. Number 6. No soul is ever abandoned by God. There are again several problems with this theology, because they contradict biblical principles and teachings. And no wonder, since once again, these are not revelations given to people from God directly, but are deceiving spirits and false prophets who twist, confuse, and distort the true gospel message. So as you can see, no matter if it's aliens, ascended masters, spiritual gods, or anything else, the consistent message is that of the denial of Jesus Christ as God. There are literally thousands of channel documents and books from people such as Edgar Cayce, Aleister Crowley, even Napoleon Hill in his famous work Think and Grow Rich. If they were aliens from a faraway galaxy, why not help us with our problems to cure cancer or teach us some form of technology that would help humanity? Why are they directly teaching that Jesus was not God, but just another master or teacher? You'll find that as many people that say that Jesus wasn't really, you know, who he said he was, he wasn't all this stuff, it's predicated on the idea that the Bible isn't an accurate description of what really happened. That always has to go in tandem with that, because anybody that's read the Bible and understands the Bible can make clear cases that Jesus did, in fact, know exactly what he was doing and exactly what he was saying. That's why the Muslims have to say that the Bible is corrupted. And so the first thing I would ask people is, what do you know? What proof do you have that the Bible was corrupted? Because as I've said before, it would be so easy to prove if it was, because there are more copies for the Bible, the New Testament, that there are for any ancient text in the history of the world. 
you know, bar none, and they are extremely scrutinized by people that both hate the Bible and people that love the Bible. So if the Bible had been changed, all a Muslim or anybody else would have to do is to say, you know, here's where the Bible said one thing, and then here these other ones say a completely different thing. All the ones after this said something different about what Jesus said on a particular issue about his deity or whatever else. But nobody can prove it. And the problem is, is that it would be so easy to prove because we have uh, documents going back from the very beginning to now. Jesus never came out and said, hey, guess what, guys, I'm God. But he didn't do it for a specific reason. Now, he did actually end up doing that, and that's why they killed him for blasphemy. You have to realize that that's why they wanted to kill him. Uh, a lot of times in the Bible when it says, and after that, the Pharisees seek to kill him. If you read what that was, it was because they realized what he was saying. They would say things like when he said he for could forgive sins, they would say, this is blasphemy. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And i got to agree with the Pharisees on that. That's absolutely true. If I came to your house and I said, hey, you know what? I just showed up. I'm, my name is Chris. I just wanted to let you guys know that I forgive you for that fight you had this morning, you know, or whatever. I forgive you for being mean to your your cousin or your brother. And you would look at me and be like, uh, who are you and what does this concern you? You're acting as if my shortcomings are somehow affecting you. That's crazy. You can't forgive me of my sins. And so that is a big part of, of that. And he said that quite often. He said that in many different contexts. And, and the, the Pharisees do say to us, who can do that but God alone? And so they would seek to kill him and things like that. They would also seek to kill him uh, because he said that he was uh, the son of God. There's actually places where they said, okay, you're saying that that's your father and that you're the son of God. How is that not blasphemy, they would say. You're making yourself equal with God. And this is a really well understood concept in, in Hebrew. If you call yourself the son of something, you are the embodiment of that thing. Begat of something, if you are begotten of something, you are that thing. For instance, a cat begets another cat. If I have a child, that child is just as much a human as I am. We're equally the same amounts of hu human. And so for that reason, if God begets a son, it's just as much God. It's not any less than God. So that, that was a massive claim to say that, especially in the context in which he said it. You know, he claimed to be before time the Son of God. He was the creator of the world. Before Abraham was, I am. His many I am statements are another unbelievably blasphemous thing to say. He, he was claiming by proxy, the, and the Pharisees, trust me, were well aware of what he was saying. He was claiming to be the voice of the burning bush. Another thing, if you understand Daniel 7, he was claiming to be the cloud rider. Uh, of Daniel 7, they knew that, and I believe it's John 8, they knew exactly what he was saying, and, and it messed with their heads. So there's many different things like that. Another big one is that he allowed himself to be worshipped on several occasions. There is several occasions where the apostles would refuse to be worshipped. Angels in several occasions said, hey, don't worship me, I'm just a messenger of God. But Jesus, on a number of occasions, allowed people to worship him. That is, either a completely blasphemous act or he was doing what everybody knew that he was doing. He was claiming to be God every day of his life, everywhere that he went, and the Pharisees knew it. That's one of the reasons they felt justified in, in killing him. So if you're reading the Bible and you're reading this, you're reading this the whole time. He claimed that he was going to come at the end of time and judge the world. Who can judge but God alone? Who's worthy to judge but God alone? The issue there is really culminates in the cross, and what happened in the cross was an act that would only make sense if God himself was on the cross. The very fact that he knew what he was doing, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and that whole concept of the gospel really makes sense in that context. So when people say that Jesus wasn't claiming to be God, they have to say that the Bible is inaccurate and all those things are not true because Jesus claimed to be God all the time. Both the New Age movement and the New World Order are about a coming evolution of mankind, the instant upgrade of humanity into higher spiritual beings, ending religious differences, a golden age where we all attain Christ consciousness, the beginning of a new civilization of mankind.
The elite believe that they are the only ones that will attain this utopia and the rest of mankind are mere cattle in the way of this goal. The New Agers believe that all mankind can attain this utopia if only they follow these esoteric spiritual teachings. In either case, the deception is called out by biblical prophecy. Throughout the centuries, theologians, scholars, Bible students, and even average people have claimed that the end of the world was upon us. Most recently were the claims made by Harold Camping that the end of the world was going to be on May 22nd of 2011. Furthermore, rulers, kings, and political leaders have been falsely labeled as the Antichrist ever since the time of Jesus. Because of these false claims and failed predictions, the urgency of prophecy has become obscure and largely tossed aside in recent years. But there are other prophetic texts which come from the esoteric authors and writers who claim to channel entities that both the New Age and the New World Order seem to be basing their agenda off of. We looked at some of this earlier, but I would like to focus on one particular author, Alice Bailey. Most New Age philosophies as well as the New World Order agenda can be traced back to the channeled writings of Alice Bailey. Her ascended master, Dejwa Kool, on many accounts gave the blueprint for the New World Order and the New Age to Bailey. Alice Bailey, especially in her book, The Reappearance of the Christ, had another prerequisite or series of prerequisites, but they a lot of them had to do with the idea that there needed to already be a world government in place. In fact, one of her quotes is, quote, First of all, he will come to a world which is essentially one world. His reappearance and his consequent work cannot be confined to one small locality or domain unheard of by the great majority, as was the case when he was here before. And she talks specifically in that book about how it's going to be accomplished through the hierarchy, the spiritual beings working with government, you know, organizations, particularly the United Nations. So she has a twofold vision that it's going to basically be a world that is already ready for him in terms of a world government. So I would agree that part of the work that she says is a prerequisite is to build and work on this sort of global government. And that is why they're striving so hard for it is because they believe they have to sort of build the throne for the world teacher kind of thing before he'll show up. Um, the chaos is another sort of part of what she talks about is that she recognizes that none of the work that she can do or that uh, the group of world servers, as she calls them, or the seed groups, they can never do enough preparation, whether it's spiritual preparation or physical building of the system preparation to actually make any of this work. Consistently throughout the book, The Reappearance of the Christ, she talks about how he will inaugurate the world religion. He will essentially provide the fuel, the power to actually cause the world to believe in a world religion. So I think that a lot of times what she talks about, the, the chaos that's necessary is sort of a twofold chaos. One that is necessary for people to agree to a solid world government to unify the existing system, the fractal system, but then also to, to empower through some sort of paradigm shift, some spiritual chaos, the world religion, because there has to be some great spiritual chaos in order to get everybody in the world on board with a new religion, especially a religion that is focused on one particular man. There has to be major, something major. Dejwa Kool, through Alice Bailey, is not shy about letting the reader know that Christianity is the one big hurdle in the way to create the new age suitable for the appearance of the world teacher. She states in the reappearance of the Christ, quote, the work and the teaching of the Christ will be hard for the Christian world to accept, though easier of assimilation in the East. Nevertheless, some hard blow or some difficult presentation of the truth is badly needed if the Christian world is to be awakened, and if Christian people are to recognize their place within a worldwide divine revelation and see Christ as representing all the faiths and taking his rightful place as world teacher. He is the world teacher and not a Christian teacher. He himself told us that he had other folds and to them he was meant as much as he has meant to the Orthodox Christian. They may not call him Christ, but they have their own name for him and follow him as truly and faithfully as their Western brethren." Quote. This idea is further confirmed when Bailey states, quote, 
There are two major factors which condition the present opportunity. These can be regarded as so completely hindering that unless they are removed, there will be a long delay before Christ can return. They are, number one, the inertia of the average Christian or spiritually minded man in every country, Eastern or Western. Number two, the lack of money for the work of preparation, end quote. Bailey also goes on to say how there must be a chaos before the unification of government and religion and the subsequent appearance of the quote-unquote Christ, stating, quote, They come in times of crisis. They frequently create crisis in order to bring to an end the old and the undesirable and make way for new and more suitable forms for the evolving light in nature. They come when evil is rampant. For this reason, if for no other, an avatar may be looked for today. The necessary stage is set for the reappearance of the Christ." End quote. If you're a conspiracy theorist like I am, the chaos, wars, and massive deaths being perpetrated by the elite is on purpose. But it's not simply to try to destroy humanity. It is a diabolical plan to again create a climate where people cry for peace and desire for a new system. This is precisely how the New Age movement is helping usher in the real New World Order. The world is already in turmoil. Injustice is everywhere, and that's no surprise. There may be a coming chaos that exceeds anything that we've ever seen before. According to the 30 years of research done by Russ Dizdar of Shatter the Darkness, a group of men and women who call themselves the Chosen Ones are at work to develop the army of the Antichrist. These men and women are usually victims of satanic ritual abuse, multiple personality disorder, and mind control. Through dark satanic rituals, these men and women have been assigned to kill and to create chaos when the call is made. This violent flash mob chaos of death and destruction is called the Black Awakening. Russ Dizdar, in his book, The Black Awakening, states, quote, They wait like a quiet, unassuming person in the crowd, a nice person who wouldn't seem like they can harm a fly, shoot a gun, or slash with a knife. But oh, buddy, they will, and with a cold-as-hell energized accuracy. They wait to be activated to kill, slaughter, and unleash hell in society so the demons can dance and their leader can emerge as savior of humanity. A savior for humanity who they say can bring a new order out of the chaos. They know what they are to do, they know what is planned, and most of them wait with dark bated breath, charged by ancient fallen spirits." End quote. What is alarming is that we have already seen glimpses of this kind of mindless murdering and unexplained evil occurring all over the world. Russ Dizdar has theorized that many of these psychotic murderers are victims of satanic ritual abuse and fall into the several categories of Satanism and Luciferianism present in the dark shadows of our society. In a book entitled Programmed to Kill, David McGowan describes these soulless killers stating, quote, in a dark and ugly netherworld where violent crimes and covert operations collide, there appear to be two general categories into which a large majority of those we label serial killers can be sorted, controlled assassins and controlled patsies, end quote. Russ Dizdar has come face to face with these demon-possessed personalities and calls them satanic super soldiers. The trauma-based mind control experiments which began in Nazi concentration camps in World War II are beginning to surface today. Both Russ Dizdar and L.A. Marzulli have theorized that the women you are about to see in this footage from a BBC documentary called Madness in the Fast Lane are demonically enhanced and possibly the satanic super soldiers that Russ talks about. These women were later found not to be on any drugs or alcohol, but the way they were able to withstand the physical damage and the display of strength these women showed is certainly superhuman. The cameraman is concentrating on the officers. He could never have anticipated what is about to happen behind them. I'm not a doctor. She has been knocked down. Is she the one that speaks English? Oh, no! Yes!
For much of my life, you've been tracking the movement, signals, and coded messages of Black Knight and sharing it with the world. Every time we share, they shut us down. Alpha team is approaching the target. This time it's different. Upload in progress. If this gets out, there'll be mass panic. Shut it down. This time, what we share will change the world.
also going to be looking at this from a prophetic uh, standpoint, something that I discovered recently written in the book of Enoch, a book that, well, in some circles of Christianity and in Judaism, that the book of Enoch is not part of Bible, but yet it's clearly part of the Ethiopic scriptures. It was even part of the Qumran community, where there has been many fragments, including an incomplete scroll of the book of Enoch that was discovered. So the Jewish people did accept the book of Enoch as an authoritative biblical scripture at one time. And in many Bibles, it still is there, including even the Etzefer that Dr. Stephen Pidgeon uh, has put out as well, where he put this book back in the Bible. Uh, so we're going to be looking at some things from there, and we're going to even be looking at some articles that have been considered um, uh, well, some might say it's fake news, some might say it's satire. Regardless of the case, there may be some very truth to it, and this is why I wanted to talk to you about these things. Uh, Antarctica has really become a major subject uh, in recent, uh, well, in fact, in the last year, even more so. There's been every kind of conspiracy theory that it is a place for a massive alien base. Uh, this is where aliens go at. We know of the um, uh, one of the former military officers, Bird, who fought a conflict uh, near Antarctica and lost a lot of men, claiming that there were flying discs, flying saucers coming out of the Antarctica. Uh, and just all, there's all kinds of evidence that does that is legitimate evidence that clearly seems to uh, show that the Antarctica is certainly a base of some sort. Uh, the Germans also under Adolf Hitler had a base down at Antarctica. There's all kinds of things that are going on in this region of the world and this year, uh, or actually last year, when the election, uh, John Kerry himself disappeared down to the Antarctica uh, during the very day of election. But what was really strange uh, is that when John Kerry went down there, he goes to New Zealand right afterwards, and there was a massive earthquake inside of New Zealand. I'm going to share with you, um, you can see some of the images here on this article here from the New York Times. They'll show you some of the images of the earthquake itself. 7.8 magnitude earthquake. The earthquake was very, very shallow, and in one article... Uh, that, that we saw that would probably be considered satire, that, uh, that they have written and stated that the reason why the earthquake happened was because John Kerry did a last-ditch effort and went down to Antarctica to try to meet with the, well, as they put it there, he was meeting with the Guardians. And the Guardians had rejected his plea to put Hillary Clinton in the White House, instead Donald Trump would become the next president of the United States. Now I realize that does, it sounds so far-fetched, sounds so crazy in fact, to even think of that. And then of course they said that the earthquake at New Zealand, uh, where he went immediately after the Antarctica visit, was a warning to him not to come back again. Well, that's what they also said in the article. Uh, those of you that remember, uh, here is a picture here of the Patriarch Kirill. Uh, Patriarch Kirill is also uh, the head of the Eastern Orthodox Church who went also to Antarctica on a very unexpected trip uh, after he met with Pope Francis in Cuba. Uh, and Pope Francis gave him a secret docu document, never was revealed exactly what was in the document, but it was the first time the two leaders of the both Eastern and Western uh, Orthodox churches had met together to try to mend their relationship. He goes to South America afterwards and then the unexpected trip to Antarctica. Well, the question is, why did he go to Antarctica? Well, in one article here, the Ark of Gabriel, Antarctica, Russia, and the Apocalypse speaks about how that the Russian government had actually moved a mysterious Ark that was discovered uh, at Mecca uh, underneath the ground there and was brought out Many people died in the process, uh, according to the article's claim here, and that Russia did a special movement of this art down to Antarctica. Now, again, whether we would say this is just a bunch of garbage or if it's really true or not, I'll just leave that up to you. But maybe what I'm going to share with you in a few minutes 
might weigh in on your thinking. So I do ask you just kind of bear with me a little bit here while we discuss these things here. Um, anyway, at Mecca, if you remember, uh, I believe it was last year, there was a quote unquote stampede. And the news reported that some 700, in one case, 717 people were killed in this stampede. This is something that has never happened before at Mecca. And actually, we found out later that it was 2,000 people were killed there in Mecca. And an apparent stampede that killed all of these people. Well, not according to some of the articles there. In fact, as you can see, this crane here that is toppled, that what was actually going on at Mecca was an excavation of this strange ark called the Ark of Gabriel that according to the uh, article here, this was something that Muhammad had said, uh, had prophesied about. And this was buried here beneath this very place. And they were working on trying to bring it out and some type of plasma release was done and it caused the death of all these people. Again, is this just conspiracy theories? Is it fabricated? Who really knows? But one thing that is a fact, though, is there was a Russian ship, a scientific ship, headed to Antarctica, and that ship did stop at the port there in Saudi Arabia, supposedly to take on supplies. Well, as you know, Saudi Arabia is not necessarily the greatest friend of Russia, but they did it anyway, right? So then after that, the ship goes to South Africa and then on to Antarctica. So they did stop and pick something up in Saudi Arabia. So maybe the article has got some truth in it after all. And then right after this ship goes to Antarctica, this is when Kirill suddenly goes down there to visit the one and only Eastern Orthodox Church at the Antarctica. So just too many strange things are happening. And a lot of people just write it off as conspiracy theories, you know, these things about aliens and, and you know, all this stuff going on in Antarctica. This is just a bunch of nonsense to begin with. Well, you know, I always kind of, I looked at these things and I think, wow, that's pretty interesting. I will tell you though, this article here that you're seeing now in English, um, this article did appear in the mainstream Russian media as well. We did a report on this back months ago, and I was trying to find the actual report I did on it. I could not find it to save my life there, uh, but I wanted to share that with you. And if you look back, maybe you can find it yourself. But when we did the report on this, we used Russian media, mainstream Russian media, that does not look at this as being just a fabrication. They actually reported it as real news and that yes, indeed, Russia did do a secret mission down to the Antarctica and had taken a thing called the Ark of Gabriel. So there is a Russian news source out there that does not look at this as some kind of conspiracy. And it went much deeper than what this article goes into it. We shared that with you once before. But then something caught my attention the other day. As you can see on your screen now, this is the Book of Enoch. I was reading in the first book of Enoch, chapter 18, and this is where the angel Uriel is taking uh, Enoch and showing him some very interesting things. And I'm going to share with you some of the words that I read here in Enoch, and then you'll see why it became very interesting to me. If we go down to say verse 4 and begin there, it says, And I saw the winds which turned the sky and caused the disk of the sun and all the stars to set. And I saw the winds on the earth which support... <clears throat> excuse me, the clouds, and I saw the path of the angels. I saw at the end of the earth the firmament of heaven above, and I went towards the south. Okay, so he goes to the end of the earth, and he speaks about going towards the south. And it was burning day and night, where there were seven mountains of precious stones, and three towards the east and three towards the south. Now, I begin to think about this. He's talking about seven mountains, but three go to the east and three go to the south. And he's talking about going towards the south. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, he's, and he's talking about it being that it burns, it burns day and night. It was burning day and night. In other words, the sun is not setting. And I'm thinking to myself, well, the South Pole, that describes the South Pole like 
no other place on earth. The sun just doesn't, it doesn't really ever set. It's always, you can, it's always daylight. And so it really caught my attention. But then he mentioned about the seven mountains. And of course he talks about the stones, etc. But then he says, east and three go to the south. Well, that really got my attention. So I thought to myself, okay, is there a place uh, down at the Antarctica that would kind of match this type of description? Well, oddly enough, there is. It's Mount Vincent. Now, you have to keep in mind what you're looking at here on your screen. You have Mount Vincent right here. It is called the Seven Summit. There are three going south. Now, you would say these are three to the west. It's actually described as southeast and southwest. But keeping in mind, when Enoch went here, the earth had not been tilted off its axis. So therefore, north and south, east and west was a bit different, right? And if you take and tilt the earth back the way it would have been, this will go just like that. And then you would have the three peaks, as it speaks about here, and we have the summit here, three peaks here. Those would go down to the south, just as he describes, and these here, the three, would go to the east, just as he describes there. The seven mountains, the seven summits and three to the east and three to the south that really began to make sense but the, but the words here in Enoch get a little bit more strange though and as I read on it says and those towards the east were of colored of stone and was of pearl and one of a healing stone and those towards the south of a red stone and the middle one reached to heaven like the throne of the Lord and uh, stibium and the top of the throne was a sapphire and I saw a burning fire and what was in all the mountains. Now, keeping in mind, the middle one was the tall one. And of course, at Mount Vincent, that's exactly the way it is. Mount Vincent is the tallest mountain. Now, I can't say that this is conclusively correct. I'm just sitting, I'm putting this here before you as a conjecture, something for you to think about, just something that I find very fascinating in line with all these anomalies that are happening at Antarctica, all the weird things that are going on. Uh, John Kerry, I mean, gosh, he did more than one visit down to the Antarctica here. Why? What's going on? Now, I, when I first looked at this, I'm thinking Planet X. They're going down there because they can see Planet X coming. All right, and maybe that has something to do with it as well. But what about some other things? I'm gonna share with you some very serious things that also that are going on down there that have been claimed by former military officers. Okay, so just hold on for a second here. It says, and I saw a place there beyond the great earth. There the waters gathered together. And I saw a deep chasm of the earth with pillars of heavenly fire and saw among them fiery pillars of heaven, which were falling as regards both height and depth. They were immeasurable. And beyond this chasm, I saw a place and it had neither the sky above it nor the foundation of earth below it. And there was no water on it and no birds but it was a desert place. Now, I'm sure now when you read this part here, well, that throws that out. Must have been out in Saudi Arabia somewhere. Maybe not. Maybe not, guys. Let's take a look at something else here that's very, very interesting. All right, let's go actually to the sevensummits.com website. And this is about Antarctica and it's about Mount Vincent and it talks about it being the tallest mountain etc. Let me read to you the Antarctica facts though. Besides the mountain summit, if you go down here to say about right up under the blue right here on your screen, the snowfall in Antarctica is so minimal that the continent has been called the world's coldest desert. The interior receives less than three centimeters, in other words, less than one inch of precipitation a year, making it the driest continent on Earth. The Antarctic dry valleys in Victoria land are among the driest places on Earth. Some scientists believe that no rain has fallen there for two million years. Astronauts have visited the dry valleys because of their similarity to lunar landscapes. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? They call it the coldest desert on earth. Well, maybe Enoch has got something when he said it was a desert. All right. As he called it, there was no water on it and no birds. 
but it was a desert place. Well, there are no birds, there are no penguins when you get that deep into Antarctica. There's just no life at all. And a terrible thing I saw there, seven stars like the great burning mountains and like a spirit questioned me, the angel said, this is the place of the end of heaven and earth. This is the prison for the stars of heaven and the host of heaven and the stars which roll over the fire. These are the ones which transgress the commandment of the Lord from the beginning of their rising because they did not come out at their proper times. And he was angry with them and bound them until the time of consummation of their sin in the year of mystery. In IURL, we go into verse chapter 19 here, real quick here, just the first verse, said to me, the spirits of the angels who were promiscuous with women will stand here, and they, assuming many forms, made men unclean and will lead men astray so that they sacrifice to demons as gods. Now, if you notice, that is a continuation. They're not dead. They're still there. And they do what? They will lead men astray so that they sacrifice to demons as gods. Wasn't that interesting? CERN not long ago where they sacrificed a young woman. Oh, they claimed it wasn't real, but found out later, according to Russian media, it was real. Russian media even was able to determine which woman it was that had been kidnapped. That was by not just so much the media, it was actually Russian intelligence officers that determined this information, but it was in Russian news, and we shared that with you here on Israeli News Live. So they sacrifice to demons as gods. They will stand there until the great day of judgment on which they will be judged so that an end will be made of them. But they still have very much access to men on this earth, and they are leading them astray, and they can trans they are assuming many forms. That's pretty wild. I mean, I've never seen anything like this in my life. And the point is that I make here, when we look in chapter 18, it appears to be, and, and it could be completely somewhere else different on the earth, all right? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying this as a conjecture to you to consider this, uh, but it appears to be that Antarctica is that region that he's speaking of. For one, it has to be a place that's burning day and night. That sun is where they can see day and night. It seems to really match up, and that's what's really, really fascinating, in my opinion there. And again, just like the mountains, if you were to take in, uh, into consideration the Andalusian destruction that tilted the Earth off its axis and put the Earth back right on its axis, and then look at the peaks here on, on the map in behind you here, then you would actually have, just as it describes there in Enoch, three to the south and three to the east, three, three peaks on a seven summit mountain range. And of course, the middle one being the tall. There's 1,477 of them worldwide. Each one has an average cost of 17 to 19 billion dollars. Each one is uh, built in the site of, uh, oh, it used to be, it'd take a year to two years to build each one. And now they're capable of building a couple of them a year uh, with sophisticated methods. My colleague, uh, 
Al Felix has actually been on some of the high-speed railways, uh, the Magneto Leviton trains that connect all the deep underground military bases within the United States. He's been on a Mach 2 train and floats off of floats off of a single rail at a, a three quarters of an inch off the rail and is uh, what you call high tech. We have nothing like this on the surface. Grim Lake is where the infamous Area 51, S4, S2, a CIA base that uh, uh, was originally a bombing range, a nuclear test site. Uh, it was later become the most secret base in the United States. Uh, it employs over 18,000 workers who work in shifts at 12 hours of, at a whack. Most of them work in the cover of darkness, like us. We built out nine underground military bases there, each with an average uh, uh, capacity, capable of uh, basically a city underground, roughly four and a quarter cubic miles hollowed out underground. They have boring machines, for instance, they don't bore, they literally vitrify and melt the rock, deflagrate the rock. It's a very sophisticated laser uh, uh, melting and deflagrating system. It reduces the rock to a powder and then melts the, the remaining rock as a coating on the inside of the base so you don't have to use gunite, cements, and other kinds of things like that. That's all the all old hat now. Uh, technology is so just basically, the new technology we get is the old hat of the military. Anyway, after we drilled all four holes, it's about a two days to drill all four of them. And when you build an underground base, you drill four basic holes, and you build you call stokes or cross-member holes across, and you black, use blasting equipment, and special blasting equipment by the analyzation of the rock formation, and you literally blast out or tunnel out uh, or deflagrate or melt rock out to build the large rooms that are required for this underground base. I was involved in building another base onto in inside of Dulce, New Mexico, which is Los Alamos Laboratory. It's a biological laboratory. On the southwest part of the Archuleta Mesa, uh, we built an underground facility, a better part of three cubic miles hollowed out underground. Then to the southwest of that, we built we were, we were in the process of the early stages of building. We drilled four large uh, tunnel-like holes. Some of them ran two and a half miles under the surface. Uh, a number of the early, at that time, a number of the original uh, uh, wells or uh, drilling uh, machines that were used were at were, uh, uh, the rate of uh, two miles a day. Of, Area 51 is only one base, one of the 131 bases. Of these 131 bases, I call Area 51 a mega base. It's got more than one base. It's Tonopah Test Range, Area 51, S2, S4, Groom Lake, and a host of others. Now, these mega bases are gobbling up our gross national product. Right now we're spending 28% of the gross national product on building underground bases solely. That doesn't count for the defense budget. That doesn't count for the spare parts budget. It doesn't count for any of that at all. And the black budget is dead, dead wrong. It sidesteps the United States Congress and its constitution of its people and says you're a bunch of morons, you don't need to know. Well, a need to know basis is an executive order written during the Eisenhower era right after the created 1954 treaty and is treasonous and illegal in this country and should be overturned and abolished. All this alien thing is fine, except for one thing. Alien takeover is a serious threat. Kept totally out of the public view, off the surface, I'm sure the underground bases, without question, are being used as a form, a place to house alien takeover. Alien takeover means the implementation of a one world government. Thanks to the people like Julian Assange, Phil Schneider, and many more who are willing 
to risk their lives to do what's right. We have been able to get the whole picture in their grand scheme of unimaginable crimes against humanity. Today, there are approximately 130 deep underground military bases in the United States alone, with depths of over a mile to almost three miles. They have nuclear-powered laser drilling machines that can drill a tunnel seven miles long in one day. The Dolls military base in New Mexico is probably the deepest. It goes down seven levels. They have been building these day and night unceasingly since the early 1940s. These bases are basically large cities underground connected by high-speed magneto-leviton trains that have speeds up to Mach 2. Trillions upon trillions of dollars have gone into this bottomless pit called the Black Budget. Obama doubled the debt himself in just eight years. In order to understand what their plans have been, we must go into the rabbit hole because it's time that we all know what's been going on under our feet. Who is the shadow government? These are the Luciferians, Illuminati elite. In ancient times, these were the giant men of renown, offspring of the fallen angels and human women who ruled the ancient earth. It is the same bloodlines that rule the earth today. These are the ones who hate and war against our Creator incarnate, Jesus. These are those who worship and sacrifice to Lucifer. They have been building up the UFO and extraterrestrial phenomena in secrecy as part of their psychological mind manipulation so when they finally disclose this deception, the world will be waiting and willing to accept their lies about these so-called ancient aliens. The shadow government has been working not with aliens, but demonic entities of the terrestrial kind. In other words, my friends, these don't come from other galaxies or outer space. These reside on Earth. Demonic entities who for thousands of years have inhabited a hybrid humanoid life form in order to carry out tasks for the shadow governments, human experimentation and genetic manipulation underground. Through their abduction phenomena technology, they target those who hate Jesus and practice witchcraft because they do not have the protection from the host of heaven. These fallen entities have given the shadow government incredible technology, advancements in the manipulation of the human genome, technology that is used on humans to extract tissue or manipulate the unborn fetus. The Luciferians have worked tirelessly to create a way for them to extend their lifespan artificially through the genetic manipulation of both animal and human DNA and have been geoengineering their habitats here on Earth. That, at the same time, causes the cancers that we consume in our foods and water, hoping to eventually phase out the organic human. They create human hybrid vessels for these demonic Nephilim to inhabit. The shadow government military 
have obtained incredible technology such as a TR-3 that can jump space They have also created viruses such as Zika and Ebola and you can find their US patents online. Trillions upon trillions have been funneled into the black budget through organizations such as the United Nations, the Vatican, NASA and other corporations. They have vested many years and lots of money for their last and grand deception and new world order agenda. Their goal is to keep control of the earth for another thousand years. So as all of this doom and gloom is manifesting and is magnified on the surface of the earth and it seems that all hope is gone comes their final act. Disclosure. Their counterfeit second coming extraterrestrial agenda supposedly from a galaxy far far away come the saviors of humanity and of course they come bearing gifts such as free energy technology that already exists but has been suppressed for decades cures for cancers that we have had all along but also been suppressed by the pharmaceutical industry who instead inflict us with cancers in order to rake in billions yearly. Their plan is to bring the human psyche to the brink of total helplessness so that we welcome their extraterrestrial agenda with open arms and accept their new revelations that according to Pope Francis will change the gospel as we know it. In other words, they plan to discredit our creator incarnate Jesus. From beautiful, tall and majestic looking beings to strange looking life forms will arrive in amazing technology. These will be the Nephilim, demons, in hybrid human vessels masquerading as our extraterrestrial brothers, not from the stars, but from the underground, bottomless pit, black budget military bases. President Trump, with the help of our allies including Russia, will put an end to this Luciferian New World Order globalist agenda. The righteous sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father throughout the earth have the opportunity to take their discernment back from everything that separates us. Religion has kept us divided for thousands of years because we have a trusting nature and therefore we are easily deceived. Jesuits slash Freemasons have the gift of speech and with their forked tongue 
can deceive the masses. We have been deceived on all fronts, through our history, through our science, and through our religion. And unlike what we have been told, we have free will and have total and complete control of our destiny, our future. Religion has kept us out of touch and out of commission from things that truly matter. It has disconnected us from the present and kept us living in a manipulated past. We must regain total control of creation. We must rid of all genetic manipulations. We must rid of Monsanto and every corporation tied to Monsanto. We must stop their chemtrails spraying of our skies. We must put the serpent seed bloodline under total containment. This we must do before our Heavenly Father comes. The Luciferians have kept our Heavenly Father's sons and daughters of every race and culture on earth under the curse of the letter and has divided us since the beginning of time. We have been under the Babylonian temple system. God's temple is not built by hands but reigns in our hearts as our spirit of righteousness and discernment.
there will be an event where Muslims will give up Muhammad and Allah. There will be lukewarm Christians who give up Jesus Christ. There will be Buddhists that give up Buddha. All across the major religions, they will give up worship of their so-called gods in favor of this new deity. And for those of you that follow my channel and others like it, I mean, that is why this whole alien deception or demons manifesting in physical form as aliens is so intriguing. Because I honestly, I honestly cannot think of a single event that would make worshippers of all the world's religions drop what they are worshipping today in favor of this new deity unless it were supernatural it was out of this world and as hollywood so eloquently shows us you know people do come together in awe and wonder wanting wisdom and knowledge i've tied that in together for you guys as well in the garden of adam and eve they were tempted by knowledge and wisdom if you look all throughout the occult and all the videos that i've done for you all the hand symbol gestures and the all-seeing eye it is all about occult wisdom and knowledge and enlightenment and rebirth and so in the end times it makes sense that the same trick will be played on us that we will be seeking knowledge and wisdom and it's almost unanimous that when we think about extraterrestrials we think of them as having superior knowledge and wisdom it's a very interesting theory Today we're taking a crucial step to secure America's future in space by reviving the National Space Council after it was has been dormant almost 25 years, if you can believe it. Today's announcement sends a clear signal to the world that we are restoring America's proud legacy of leadership in space. Our Vice President cares very deeply about space policy. And for good reason, space exploration is not only essential to our character as a nation, but also our economy and our great nation's security. The human soul yearns for discovery by unlocking the mysteries of the universe. We unlock truths within ourselves. That's true. Our journey into space will not only make us stronger and more prosperous, but will unite us behind grand ambitions and bring us all closer together wouldn't that be nice but will unite us behind grand ambitions and bring us all closer together wouldn't that be nice Can you every launch into the skies is another step forward toward a future where our differences seem small against the vast expanse of our common humanity sometimes you have to view things from a distance in order to see the real truth. It is America's destiny to be at the forefront of humanity's eternal quest for knowledge. It is America's destiny to be at the forefront of humanity's eternal quest for knowledge. And so in the end times, it makes sense that the same trick will be played on us that we will be seeking knowledge and wisdom. At some point in the future, we're going to look back and say, how did we do it without space?